Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. You are on Real Talk for Real Life with your host, April Michelle. And I'm usually here with my co-host, Elder Brian Martin. But today I have a very special friend and sister, my best, best friend, Dr. Cassandra Andrews Jackson. Say hi, Cassie. (laughs) Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here with my bestie, Michelle, April Michelle, although (laughs) I call her hobby. Yeah, she calls me hobby. And uh, everybody will be seeing my face after today and hers because she made me. <laughs> I did, I did. I made she you. She made me. She said, you need to show your face. And I'm like, oh, God. So this is my first uh, encounter doing this video. Hopefully more will come. I thank you, sis. So today our subject is about to give or not to give, that is the question. And it's basically talking about offerings and um, gifts that are given in our worship service, which we know that offering is is a part of our worship. But I wanted more elaboration on it because I know that a lot of times there is some apprehensiveness about giving, especially when you don't have a lot to give and when Uh you feel like you are being made to give your last when you know that you need that last. So I uh-huh. wanted my sister, who is a phenomenal teacher, to really give a breakdown of the scriptures because we want to do what God tells us to do. And we want to be in compliance and not to make be made feel to make to be feeling that you are being roped into doing something, you know, that you don't feel comfortable doing. So I want us to talk a little bit about the scriptures that talk about giving. So the floor is yours, darling. So one of the important things that you said in your introduction to the topic is, particularly people feel like they don't have a lot to give. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you feel apprehensive, you feel ashamed, you think, oh my goodness, Everybody else has so much more to give and I don't have it. Um, what, what, what is my little bit going to do? Is that going to contribute to this big church or small church or the expenses that we're doing? Is that really going to help? So that, that was an important segue because I really want to start here. So if you think about example with Jesus standing in the temple and he saw this widow come in and all she had was a mite. That's what the scripture actually calls it, uh, a widow's mite. And it's in Mark chapter 12. And a mite is not, it's not much. It's almost like pennies. But the fact of the matter is that that's all she had. And she gave it. She didn't have a lot, but she still wanted to give. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus said about this particular woman that that which she did, then that is notable to him because it wasn't how much she gave, but the fact that she wanted to give, even though she didn't have much and she still sacrificed from what she did have. So we as believers have to get away from this idea that I have to give a lot. And actually how much you, the measure of a lot is based on how much you have, right? So a person could have a million dollars and they give a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, that sounds like a big number, but they have a million dollars, you know? <laughs> Whereas you have a person who has a hundred dollars and they give 60. Well, they've technically given more than the person who gave the hundred thousand right. dollars. And that's the way Jesus looked at it when he looked at the widow's might. So we have to now let the scriptures tell us how to think about what we give instead of measuring what we give based on comparing ourselves with other people. And that's always going to be our challenge to let the scripture tell us what to think. And the scripture says what you give based on how much you actually have, that's the measure. So if, if a cent, if you have only two cents and you give one of those, You've given more than a person who's given $200,000, you know? And it really talks about your willingness to give. So we have to let the Bible change our minds about what we do. 
Amen. So, it, but it was her heart that was um, wanting to give mm -hmm. that God that Jesus saw that mm -hmm. it was you know she gave from her heart. It wasn't mm -hmm. about uh, that she was thinking about. Well, I gotta buy groceries, or this is all I have. She gave because this is what she wanted to do, and there was a pureness in that. And I, I, I think that that what that's something that we are lacking. Mm -hmm. The pureness. Uh, when uh, when we talk about it in our churches, especially when we're doing offering, uh, tithes and offerings, giving to the pastors or the preacher or whoever that uh -huh. comes to render the uh, service of the word. Um, I think that there has been this dynamic of, of if you give a dollar, your dollar is not good enough. If you mm. gotta give, yeah, and I've heard this. And uh, it's, it, you, you know you got more. You know that $5 that you have and that, or that $10 that you was going to use for a pizza pie or whatever the case may be. <laughs> and, and, and the thing is, and they, it, for me, it feels like you're guilting me into oh. doing something that I know that I, I want to give, I can give you a dollar, I can give you even five, but if I know that if I give you that, I'm not going to be able to do what I need to do afterwards. So I can give you a, a portion of what I have that won't infringe on what I need to do. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to elaborate on, on those things because sometimes that can be a little challenging because I, I, I am one of those that have had a problem. I, I'm going to be honest because I'll give. I have no problem because I know it's part of worship. I, I know it. Um, but I think that when you present it to me like that, and I have to tune it out because if I don't, I won't give. And I don't want to be that person. So, but, but other people don't have that luxury to do that. They, if you pick them off, they're like, I ain't giving nothing. And we don't <laughs> want to be, we don't want to be there because we want to be in compliance with the word of God. Yeah. So can you elaborate on some of that for me, please? Thank you. So let's start with compliance to the word of God. So let's understand what even the standard is. So if you want to know what you should be giving, what many of us have been taught is, um, and I'm not just talking about when you're giving to a preacher, but just offering in general. Mm -hmm. Many of us have been taught that we should give a tithe, which mm -hmm. is 10%. Now, one of the things that stands out to me is that the church in the early days, I'm talking first century, right after Jesus was crucified and ascended, the early church was 100% Jewish. Mm -hmm. So that made sense for them. They will continue potentially giving 10% and all the other offerings that went from the Old Testament covenant. But when you have Paul in Corinthians talking about, about how to give, and he talks about giving um, good measure, pressed down, shaking together, child, men given to your bosom. Let me just quickly find that scripture because it's important. Um. No, that's not it. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. What does it say? You know the one that I'm thinking yeah. about. The, six, you know, the, the, um, the fold, it says 30, 60, 100 fold that he would no. give back. No, not that one. Oh, my goodness. And I have it in my mind and I can't you think of it right now. Shaking together, running over. That's actually in it. Luke when Jesus talks about, well, Luke, and that's a good one. We can use that because this is Jesus speaking. Luke 6 and 38. It's, Jesus says, given it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men given to your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So that's Jesus telling his disciples how to give. He didn't uh -huh. say tithe. Right. He right. said give. And it shall be given unto yeah. you. Ah, cheerful giver. That's what it right, is. Right, the cheerful giver, yeah. So if we take... Uh, Luke 6 and 38, and then we look at 2 Corinthians 9 and 7, which says, every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Right, right. And he says, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow mm -hmm. bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. But how do you define sparingly and bountifully? But there's no <laughs> number attached to it. But that's the, that's the problem, that there is, in, when we, when it's being presented over the, 
the pulpit or with a mic, that there is a measure in some way. But there isn't. That's just it. So we have to know the scripture <laughs> as the believer. Bountifully is not a number. Sparingly is not a number. Only I as an individual, only I know whether I'm giving bountifully right. or sparingly. So is that in connection like with um, uh, the two, the husband and wife that dropped dead Sapphira and Ananias and Sapphira. Is, they, that, is that in the same? They tried to hold back a, a part of the price. So they were trying to deceive the people. They were trying to get fame for doing something that they weren't really doing. Doing, okay. So that's separate. But this here, oh, when you okay. think about the tithe, the tithe is a precise number. Mm -hmm. It's 10%. And some people give 10% of their net. And I'm talking New Testament. 10% right. of their net, 10% of their gross. Right. Either way. But the reality is 10% doesn't define sparingly or bountifully. It doesn't. That has it has to be in your heart. You heart. know in yourself whether you're being sparing or whether you're being bountiful. So if we go back to the widow's might, Jesus know, knew that she was being bountiful. Mm. She was sowing bountifully. So that's why Jesus commended her. Because out of the little bit that she had, she had a bountiful heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can think about that. When, and I was starting to say that the early church was Jewish, so perhaps they would give the 10%. But here, both in Luke 6 and 38, and then 2 Corinthians 9, you see this redefinition of how you should give. It's no longer 10%. It's give, and right. it will be given. It's so sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. No number attached to it so now the individual believer has to be honest within themselves the bible in psalms says i want truth on the inward parts so you have to be honest in you do you are you being sparing or are you being bountiful right now when you take that of the individual believer where somebody can't tell you what's sparing or bountiful you can't tell just mm -hmm. so the individual believers have to be trained the, the purpose of the fivefold gifts in Ephesians 4 is to train the believers, the disciples, to get away from this thinking of 10%. Give me a number so I can just check off this box. Look, I gave my tithe. I'm done. You got to get away from that. Right. And you have to now be renewed in your mind. And the only way that's happening is if the fivefold gifts are teaching us the scriptures and telling us about sparing and bountifully and telling us about being honest in our hearts. They have to teach us that. And allow the scripture to renew us so that when I show up at church and I have a hundred dollars and the spirit says to me, give 99. Well, okay, here, 99. Mm -hmm. Or if the spirit says, give two, here is two. Or if yes. the pastor gets up and says, listen, we have a financial need, which organized religion in a building with heat and light and gas, right. you got to buy the tithe envelope. You got to pay somebody to clean the place. You, there are expenses. There are fixed expenses for right. a church. So when the pastor gets up and says, hey, you know what? We need $1,000. That's a finite number. But still, if I'm sitting in the congregation with a bank account that has $10 million in it, and the pastor says he needs $1,000 and I give $20. Right. Right. But I can, I can afford to give $1,000 twice, three times. Triple the time. You know, yes. it's like, yeah. So I'm being sparing. Right. But mind you, the next person sitting next to me who only has maybe $20 in their pocketbook, the pastor says, listen, I need $1,000. They take the whole 20, they put the whole 20 in, and they say, you know what? That was my cab fare to go home, but I'll take the bus. Right. That person is being bountiful with their $20. Right. right. And that's what we have to be taught. So when the Bible talks to us in Romans about renewing our mind, be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. It talks about all those little things because we're still thinking the same way we used to think when we were in the world. And then there's this all people talking about, oh, the pastor's trying to rob me and he's living in a big house. And he's driving a car and I'm in an apartment. Okay. Let's, now we can talk about muzzling the ox. Right. And shredded out the corn. Right, because um, I think that that's the issue with when you see a lot of um, ministers or pastors or these 
event televangelists on TV, and this is what uh -huh. people equate the pastor to be overall because of what they see on t television. Uh -huh. And so they say that all preachers, all pastors, all this are the same, which is not true. Uh -huh. um, there are some, there are a lot of them who actually still work. Uh -huh. they, they have their own job, have jobs. Some of them have their own businesses uh -huh. and they have been paying their, for their own mortgage. The church is not paying for their mortgage. Uh -huh. So it's a misconception that uh -huh. that all practices and all preachers are taking the congregants' money and utilizing it for their own personal uh -huh. gain, which is a sad thing. Um, so, but when coming to that, blessing the pastor, which is not a problem because we're supposed to take care uh -huh. of our pastor because he is is doing a great work for the uh -huh. Lord. Uh -huh. And for the people of God, because uh -huh. God has entrusted him with, uh, you know, he uh -huh. has entrusted that pastor for our souls. So uh -huh. we should take care of him, whether it's financially or just, you know, giving him a little something to say, hey, thank you for never giving up, never, you know, just walking away, you know, never just, you know, just shutting me out, just being there for me, praying right. for me even when I didn't deserve it. You know, thank you. Uh -huh. So. I know that, but sometimes people don't get it. And then when you hear it across the pulpit, if I only had, again, this is about what I have. So uh -huh. if only I have $15, right? I'll give 10 of that because I think I can, I know I'm going to get more. So I'm, I can give you the 10, no problem. But then you say, if you don't have, if I only have 15, you're saying, give 20, borrow the five from somebody that I have a problem with uh -huh, uh -huh. because I feel like you're now you're putting me in debt to make, to come to, uh, you know, this, you know, you want this amount of money that you want to give to the preacher that came in. I understand your goal, but don't put me in debt to put, to, to give a goal that you were trying to meet to this, Pastor, I get it, but I don't. I, that's another way that I feel like you're, you're putting a chokehold on me. So, what do you, uh -huh. what do you think about that? So, you said um, this misconception that people have. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes it is actually a misconception, but it's also a convenient misconception. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Some people are glad to hear, they are glad to see that the pastor or the leader appears to be doing better than the rest of the people because that's an excuse for them not to give, which they were looking for anyway. Right. I agree. So even if everything was perfect, they didn't want to give anyway. So this just is convenient for them. So you can say, well, listen, I ain't giving him my money because look, in their heart, <laughs> In their heart, we come back to what's going on in your heart. The Bible, mm -hmm. one, it says truth on right. the inward parts, mm -hmm. creating me a clean heart. If your heart is not clean, you didn't want to give anyway. You're stingy, you're selfish, whatever it may be. <laughs> you didn't want to give anyway. Right. So let's, there's that. Right. And then it's, we can't blame either the pulpit or the congregation. It has to be an adjustment on both sides. Okay. So the congregation, the lay people, the ones who are being asked to give, we have to take on what we talked about there, this right attitude mm -hmm. of sowing bountifully, understanding about giving a might, having the right heart. We have to have that right understanding. We have to be willing to sow our carnal things because we are reaping spiritual things, which is what Paul talks about. If somebody is coming to you and they are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to you that saves your eternal soul from eternal damnation, where is your gratitude? Mm. Mm. And how much does, if you really had to put a number on that, saving you from hell, right. well, let, let, let's even just go there. Let's say you're already saved and this person, this pastor, Every Sunday, it's showing up and preaching. Every Friday, they're teaching you. Don't you appreciate the spiritual blessings that they are sowing into your life? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Where is your appreciation? Where is your gratitude? 
Again, we have to be taught to be grateful. Why don't we appreciate the spiritual seeds that are being sown? Why don't we appreciate that? And if, in fact, now that I'm reaping from your spiritual and I'm just going to give you $20, I'm going to give you $100,000, whatever it is, you right. can't buy your way out of hell. You can So there has to be an adjustment. We have to grow up as the lay people. And then from the pulpit, the leaders have to stop using manipulation mm -hmm. and all these antics, telling people to borrow $5, go to the ATM, use your credit card. And so I have to pay interest on the money that I'm given to, in offering. Mm -hmm. That's not what God intended. Right. That was not God's plan. So we have to grow up and the pulpit has to adjust. Everybody has to come in alignment with the scriptures so that we have the right relationship as prescribed by the Bible. Now, when you're talking about people who are coming in, that whole dynamic, <clears throat> that whole dynamic of guest preachers coming in and you got to give them an offering and all of that, no problem, no problem. Right. I understand that the pastor hopefully is doing that for the right motive. He wants to bring in someone who's going to bless his congregants, mm -hmm. to give them information that perhaps they didn't have. Maybe they need revival, as we like to call it. Hopefully, all things being equal, that's when he has the right motive for doing that. Right. Okay, when the preacher comes in, again, they're sowing spiritual to you, and we want to give. So why are we giving bountifully? Why aren't we giving bountifully? Is it because we don't appreciate the spiritual things? So even though you, the pulpit does these manipulative things, try to get me to give more. Well, that's because I don't appreciate what I've been given. Or maybe I haven't received anything from this sermon. Let's call a spade a spade. <laughs> maybe uh -huh. I was not good spiritual food. That could be it. Because it does say the workman is worthy of his hire. But I, I, I've heard, uh, I mean, especially my pastor, he brings in phenomenal, phenomenal speakers, you know, in, including your husband. So it's, I don't think it's that because I can only speak from where I am. And I think it's about the heart of the people if they're mm -hmm. not being taught. And when you've heard certain things over and over and over again, and it comes off kind of like not right. Now, mind you, I'm going to give you an example in the natural. My mother used to give me cod liver oil and I couldn't stand it. But it was the best thing for us during winter months when you weren't feeling well. These are the things that helped you. Mm -hmm. But as an adult, now I know I should be taking cod liver oil, but I won't do it because I remembered how it made me feel when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Now I know it's good for me. I know it, but I won't do it. I won't mm -hmm. do it. And that's and I kind of feel that that's the way it is with people. They've heard stuff over and over again, and they get numb to it. And they know it's good, but they just feel like, you know what? I don't need to do all that. They could, If they know the same God I, I know, they can get money from God. The God will mm -hmm. take care of them. This is the mindset sometimes. And I think that there needs to be a, re, a shifting of re, uh was it uh, reevaluating and um, reteaching because we don't do enough of that. Uh -huh. I see a lot of teaching on on the internet. Eh, it's it's cool, but honestly, we we as a the body of Christ, we need really need to be on the same page because we are not giving the same information. I mean, I hear bits and pieces of of the Word of God, but there there is this thing about self alignment with the word uh, you know trying to make it fit your way of thinking as opposed uh -huh. to what god thinks and that's somewhat of the problem because we're not okay so we the giving is appropriate but why why should we give because the word says that we should give uh -huh. instead of saying that the pastor said you should give uh -huh. you understand so it's so it's like you're taking the power away from God. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you use God as your whipping, you know, like, like God, God's going to get you if you don't do. Yes. And, and so I, 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 I want to kind of like help us to get away from that because I don't, 
those little things, these little things that we, you know, we don't teach people and we don't show them the right way. God is going to hold us accountable for these things. Right. And you don't want that. And you, you know, and you'll be one of the ones who was doing the, the right thing. You seem like it was the right thing. And then when it time, when God comes, when Jesus comes back and he's like, well, I did all these things in your name. And he said, well, you didn't do it from your heart. You were doing it because you were trying to, you know, get over. Yeah. And we don't want that. We want everybody to get a clear understanding of God's word. Don't try to change it. And that means from the beginning to the end, don't try to change it. Don't, you know, um, act, um, apply it. The things that only you feel that are good and other other things you throw away. No, I, I don't even, honestly, I don't even believe in Throwing, well, eating the meat and throwing away the bones because the bones have nutrients in it too. You can yeah. make you can make you can make a stock out of that. So the bones have some some you know because I've heard that I'm not saying it, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. It's like come on, we gotta we have to do better. I mean, I I am a firm believer of of um I don't know everything. And, and I know you don't either, but you know more than me. And I, I figured I would come to you to give me some clarity because I know how much you love God's word and you will never try to put it, you know, imply that this is the way I think. This is what God says. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that. So I, I kind of wanted you to go into, you know, a little more about the giving because I want to make sure that our listeners uh, understand that it's 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 giving is is a privilege it's not a it's not a task mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. and 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 i think you had mentioned something about ma um tithes and offerings that's another scripture that people use malachi three and eight yes it's, uh, you know because i want you to explain more about the tithes and offerings a little more because I, I mean and i didn't even think about the um what is it uh the jews in that time it was it was a jewish that was yeah. everybody who was coming together it was they were jewish it wasn't right. the gentiles exactly and so that's an ex, uh, we can revisit that so yeah the new testament church in the beginning that first century it was 100 mm -hmm. percent jewish but mm -hmm. then you see people like cornelius coming into salvation and other uh, gentile people so paul is going to all these gentile cities and he's preaching to all these gentiles but at no point if you read through all of the epistles you can read through the whole New Testament. You will never see a command to people to tithe. Now, the, yeah, the Gentiles who were coming into the church who were accepting Jesus Christ, there were several things that they told them you need to do, right? They, when they had that, uh, the council, Jerusalem council, when Paul went back to meet with the apostles to talk about how are we going to deal with the Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. There were three things they came up with. They said no fornication. Mm -hmm. Don't eat anything offered to blood and mm -hmm. don't worship idols. They say nothing about tithes. <laughs> so, okay, let's leave that off. Let's okay. throw that back to the side. We continue. Paul wrote these letters to the Galatian churches. Right. He never told them tithe. What you do see is what we just saw in the uh, second Corinthians. Okay. So bountifully, reap bountifully. <laughs> so sparingly, reap sparingly. He didn't say anything about 10% tithe. And when I looked at that, I said, oh, okay, well, I'm a Gentile, so that must apply to me too. I'm not Jewish. Now, please don't go getting me in trouble saying oh, Cassie no, no, said no, don't no. tithe. No, 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 and no. all no. the people who are listening to this do not say <laughs> that Cassie said don't no. tithe. I'm just telling you what I see in the scriptures. No, baby. I'm not, no, this is not. The thing Y'all want to argue? Don't argue. I'll tell you that's what I saw in the scriptures. The and thing. then they don't tell me to tithe. Now, here's the thing. A 10% tithe of my little $600, you get $60. Right. But if I decide, if the Lord lays on my heart to be bountiful, you might get $200. Or well, 300 Instead That's of true. the tithe. That's true. And so there's an extension. It seems to we bountifully, so bountifully, you know, it, it seems like there's an extension of it. It's like, it's, um, it's, um, how would I say? Because the ten percent, there's a, there's a, it's finite, amount, right? It's finite, right? It's, it's a specific amount that you're supposed to do, but the, it's like the bountifully, it's like any amount, right? Counts. It's like it's limitless, kind of like loosey goosey. Now, what yeah. am I supposed to do? 
So but what you're supposed to do is in your heart. Right. So that this is a this heart. is a hard thing. That's, it's your heart. And I think that that's what needs to be. But challenged. here's the thing, Michelle. <laughs> it's much easier to tell somebody give ten percent and to train them to be mm. spiritually astute, to train them to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. It, that takes time and investment and commitment so that people's minds are changed. I've said this already. In right. order for your mind, your heart has to be renewed. It has to be transformed so that you are conformed to the image of Christ. That takes time. But here's the thing. In the meantime, I have to pay $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 a month for this church that we're all meeting in. I'm going to do that. Uh, right. How am I going to do that? <laughs> exactly. So you go like, uh, what are we well, going to do? Well, let me ask you this. Because, see, the thing is, I, I, you know, the early church, they didn't mm. have the buildings that we had. Aha. So that's the logical conclusion. That's the next step. <laughs> and you shouldn't have these things where you feel like you have to do, make, do these antics and have the butch ride and, the, you know, uh, the Southerners Club and the pay dues and all, all of this stuff. right mm -hmm. and the chicken and sandwiches all the things that we mock and we make fun of about church but there's a reason those things are in place because there are expenses for these buildings that we have these meeting places but do you think that these small. are but do you think these places are distractions from what we're really supposed to be doing because truth this uh, <laughs> I, I, listen I'm just, honestly since during this pandemic. Now, before the pandemic, we have we didn't we didn't have a building. We were uh, renting a space from the schools. Yes. Now the schools are open now, but they're not letting outsiders other than the students come in. Mm -hmm. So we may have an opportunity maybe in September to go back. I don't know what the rules are going to be, but I'm saying mm -hmm. for the last almost what. Going on four years, we haven't had a building. Okay. So our expenses of overhead have been really low. Yeah. Just, so, but you're still reaching souls. We're still doing things. But for me, there is some, you know, other things that I'm concerned about, but I won't, I won't say that over here on the podcast. But I see that we're still doing ministry even without being in the building. So mm -hmm. I'm not under, so is the building more important than ministry? Is well, it, no, is they're, not, they're not synonymous. They're okay. not synonymous. It's not the same thing as ministry doesn't need a building necess necessarily. But, people uh, but I want to point this out that when Jesus convened the disciples to have the Passover supper, Mm -hmm. that last supper there was a space now he didn't have to pay for that space but there was space but they was, gathered but, it was a, but, but but the thing is that wasn't his space all the time but there was space right he but, didn't incur expense no and even when the disciples were in the upper room that was space right for that time and they had expenses in the early church which was why the people were selling to your point about ananias and sapphira mm -hmm. the, the people who had property were selling what they had so okay. that they could help support each other so the idea is that as a as a group the, the church is supposed to be self-sufficient right. and help each other and take care of each other right and we do this out of our good hearts our compassion for each right. other a compassion for reaching a lost world. Right. All of it, but that has to be in our heart, which brings us back again to renewing our minds. Minds, right, right. But but that's what I was saying before. I said all the other expenses that we could, the, the truth is like, we have our own personal rent, cars, food, all the, you know, all the expenses personally. Of life. And, of life. And then outside of that, the, well, after I've paid everything off, I have to now give more to another expense. And, and, and it's okay, but I just feel sometimes it's not necessarily all the time. Not the, not the giving part. I'm talking about the building part because I know that ministry can still happen. And if you didn't have that extra expense over your head you would be less stressed and uh -huh. the finances that we 
with a crew of that house, we could use it for the neighborhood. We could use it for people who are in need. But if you're stretched to your limit, it makes the people feel frustrated. Uh -huh. And when you have frustrated people, you have people who are not willing to give. Uh -huh. You're always begging and pleading. And this is a problem because now we can't do what we need to do because I'm, I'm trying to deal with life. And then now I got to deal with this. And then you're trying to make me feel guilty about not doing this. And I'm like, I feel so bad. And, th and that shouldn't be the case. That uh -huh. shouldn't be the case. But it is. This is our reality right now. How do we make it better? So what you're talking about there is a drastic paradigm shift. What you're talking about is taking the church back to first century Christianity where there were no buildings, where they met in homes, where initially the church Christians, believers were able to meet in the synagogues, which were already established buildings. There were no expenses associated with that until the church the people were kicked out of the synagogues and they had to meet somewhere. So we are talking about going back to first century Christianity. There have been so many hundreds of years of socialization around the church buildings that I'm not even sure that that's realistic. I know, but I'm but because we, it, have we can important. adjust. We can adjust. We can find the scriptural way to relate. We had to adjust. We the the pandemic showed us that we can adjust. No, no, I'm not talking about outreach and not having a building. I'm talking about even if you have a building with expenses, that the church, that the leadership of the church and the lay people in the church can relate in such a way as it pertains to money. That is scriptural. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So okay. that, yeah, we still have a building. I ask for a thousand dollars because that's what the expense is. I don't have to beg. I don't have to offer you a chicken sandwich. I can just say, this is what we have. We have need. And the people who are sitting there who know that they can afford to give $20, $500, whatever it is, we all pull together because this is the place that we got our this is the place where we meet, we have we fellowship. This is the place where we receive our spiritual blessings. We want to make sure that this place continues. And that's a part of the whole a, a different paradigm shift where the lay people take ownership for the church. You take ownership of the building. This is your church, just like it's your house. And Haggai, um, Haggai says to, to he's a prophet, the mm -hmm. Lord told Haggai, to say to the people, listen, you came back from Israel, yes, you rebuilt yes. from Babylon, you rebuilt your houses, uh -huh, and uh -huh. the temple is in ruins. Yes. Don't you see that when you reap and you bring stuff home, you put money in a bag with holes that when mm. you sow grapes, they, they, you can't even drink from it. You have a blanket and you can't get warm. Don't you see? You are cursed because you are allowing the temple to be in disrepair. Uh -huh. but you're taking care of your house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is just as apropos now, even in the New Testament, that if I'm taking care of my house, but the church is falling apart, the right. church can't pay its rent, the church mm -hmm. can't meet its expenses. And again, I'm not talking about a pastor who has a million dollar salary. Right. That's why I said it has to be an adjustment on both sides. Both sides, right. So you're going to have a reasonable little offering, whatever it is, and you keep the job. If all the work, you can work. <laughs> It's true. It's true. Paul made tents and he wrote the, the New Testament that you preach it from. You tell me you can't keep it up. Mm. You can't do something to make ends meet that the whole the your entire household is dependent upon the church. And then you want to have a certain lifestyle that is exorbitant and completely out of proportion to the people that you're serving. That's true. You are the servant of the church. The church is not your servant. So there has to be an adjustment on both sides. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. I think we need to stop looking at uh, outside entities, especially televangelists who, you know, I don't know. I don't agree with all of them. Not all of them. And less coaches and, 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 and holy yeah. water from the and Jordan. It's, it's you a lie. Yeah, it's a lie. And it's shameful that the people, when they see this, because it's convenient. And then you make 
you <laughs> you you uh then you apply this convenience to everybody else who's not on TV and you make it seem like this is what's happening around the world when it's not. It's, it's a not. it's a handful of them who have made themselves accessible to television to to reap these uh lies. I'm sorry, but it is lies and deception across the television to make you think that this is what God wants. Uh -huh. And that's not what God wants. He doesn't and then, want. And then sorry, when you yeah. think about, um, again, coming back to this idea of helping us to grow spiritually, mm -hmm. we are definitely in a generation where Second Timothy 4 and 3 is real. The time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine mm -hmm. says you should sow bountifully. Instead, after your own lust, you heap to yourself teachers having itching ears. You want the person who's going to tell you if you sow a seed and you're going to reap da 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 and send me a thousand dollars and God's going to send you a check in the mail for that's convenient. That's what you want to hear rather than having your mind regenerated to sound doctrine. Right. right. So we, it, it's sort of self perpetuating mess. I, I go find the people who are going to tell me what I want to hear and the people who need something from me, they're going to tell me what I want to hear. Right. And so we're like scavengers on each other and put God in the middle and say, God has blessed this mess. No, he has not. He has not. He has not. And, and I, I take offense to anyone who lies on God because God will take care, good care of you. It's not he right. takes offense too. I know he does. I know he does because we, you know, Whatever he doesn't like, we're supposed to be the same way, you know? Amen. And goes and, right there. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's really a shame because we know that God's word doesn't change. And he's mm -hmm. already given us, and especially at the end in uh, Revelations, I was saying to uh, somebody uh, last week that if you take anything out of this book, you know, there's going to be consequences. And if you yes. add anything to this book, there's going to be consequences. Uh -huh. And these are not good consequences. No. You know, this, so, and people don't get it that God is not a joke. No. He is so serious. Uh -huh. I said, right now, he is, he's not even love. He is waiting. That's all he, he's waiting. When the time is right and when it comes, it's not going to be good. And you need to be on the right side, just like when, um, I think it was Moses, and said, "Who's on the Lord's side?" <laughs> you know, I think it's Joshua, Joshua. Joshua. Excuse me, Joshua. Who's on the Lord's side? So it's like you need to know who are you, whose side are you on? I said, if if it's flamboyant, oh, I think you're right. This is Moses. I think you're right. It is Moses. Well, I'm I'm remembering like who's going to be on because there was um was it when the earth opened up and it three thousand of them died. You remember when his, who was on the Lord's side? Was Something with the priest, the priest, and he yeah. said, who, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> anyway, whoever's on, you right. need to be on the Lord's side. <laughs> Just be on the Lord's side because Amen. At, at the end of the day, that's the right side. You know, mm -hmm. when in Deuteronomy, God wrote to the people, he said he wrote curses and blessings. Mm -hmm. And then he said to them, please choose Blessings. Mm -hmm. Choose the right. Choose this. Mm -hmm. I'm, giving you the, I'm giving you the dynamics of both sides, but I need you to choose the right thing. Yes. So I'm telling. I'm pointing you in the direction. I'm giving you both sides because I want you to understand what each one of them <laughs> means. So I need you to, but I want you. I honestly want you to ch choose blessings. But yes, it, it's it, like it, the teacher gives you a test and tells you. <laughs> There's four answers, A, B, C, and D, but D is the right answer. And you still choose A. What's up with that? <laughs> you could have yeah. a V8. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Your V8 moment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, 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 and you know, God's love letters to us is just so profound. He loves us unconditionally, and he points it out in the word all the time. His word from the beginning to the to the end is a, his heart mm -hmm. pouring out to us, mm -hmm. letting us know what he desires from us and for us. Mm -hmm. And yet we're just spitting on him and saying, God, I don't want that. I don't want that because I, I want my own desires. I want my mm -hmm. own thing. You know, what you're giving me is 
it's it's superficial. It's not enough. Mm. Your flesh is speaking, and right. you need to tell flesh to shut up. Okay, yes. because it's going to put you in a position where you can't get out of. So you know, again, we're talking about to give or not to give. That is the question. Yes, and giving is a part of your worship. Yes. Now, you may not agree with it, but you need to come to a resolution to it because God's word is not going to change because you don't agree. Right. You need to understand it is connected to your blessing. Well, wasn't that a wonderful segment? Well, stay tuned for the second part with Dr. S uh, Cassandra Andrews Jackson to give or not to give. That is the question. I just want to thank her so much for giving us more insight on why we should give and how to give and why it's so important to give according to the word of God. I'm your host, April Michelle. Peace.